Hey everyone, Victor here. We're continuing along with a bunch of beginner type videos. Love to get more people into mapping. So today I'm going to be going over five common mistakes that beginners make when you're working on some of your first maps and putting them out there for other people to use. So let's just get right into it. Number one is uh, people getting stuck in your map. So what do I mean by that? People getting stuck in your map. Well, have you ever been scrolling down a page and then you hit this map and you're scrolling and your mouse lands in it and now you're zooming in and out on the map? Yeah, this is a thing that happens all the time. It happens so commonly actually that I think it's why Google changed it so that now you don't zoom normally with scrolling on a Google map. It, whenever you try to do it, it says like press control and zoom in and out. Pretty crazy thing. I think it's because people were getting stuck in maps. And this happens a lot when you're a beginner. You put a big map super wide, it takes up the whole page, it's right there when land, and you have a bunch of content under it, but people like can't get to it because they can't get past your, um, your map. And this also happens in mobile. You're on your phone, you're zipping up and down a page, and suddenly you hit the map and the map is suddenly moving, but you can't get past the map to keep going to the bottom of the page or wherever you want it to go. You're like stuck in this map. And if the map takes up the whole screen, you have to like find something that isn't the map to like flick past it and hope you get past. This is a thing that people do. So how do you avoid this? What do you do? One thing is you can make sure your map doesn't take up the whole vertical area of the screen so that when people go past it, they get stuck for a second and then they go, oh, there's a little bit of non-map down there. Let me go mouse over that and scroll. Another thing is to do what Google did, which is to disable scrolling to zoom in your map. This might be a bit of a dangerous solution because then sometimes for people that are map users or really want to use your map, uh, they expect to be able to scroll. Um, but you know, for a lot of basic maps, you can just have little zoom buttons up in the corner that have a plus and a minus, and people can use those to zoom in and out. Perfectly viable, perfectly normal use. And then, of course, make sure your map is placed in a nice way. Don't take up the whole screen unless the map is the absolute centerpiece of your website. So be careful about people getting stuck in your map. It's a common thing. Two, common mistake people make, or common thing you don't really test, and this will come up a couple times, is mobile clicking versus hovering in desktop. So a lot of times we want to have cool effects, like we have the marker uh, pop open this little pop-up or something like that with a bunch of information when we hover over it. But we have to remember that in mobile, there's no hover. You don't hover your finger on something. You either are touching it or you're not when you're using a mobile. Uh, device. So uh, remember that most people that use the internet nowadays are using it on a mobile device. Most people. So majority of your visitors to whatever you're, you're building are probably going to be on their phones. So if you have a ton of hover effects, they're either never going to see them or they're going to happen when they press on it. So if you have a click event and you have a hover event, they might be overlapping each other and you might have some unexpected effect. So make sure you keep that in mind when you're designing these hover and click events. Most of the time, the click event will be transferred automatically to a touch event. So if you set a click to open a marker pop-up, most of the time that will then work in mobile, but test it. So generally, hover is better for doing things like highlighting something. So when people are hovering uh, and it's kind of telling them click, right? Whereas in mobile, people don't need that. They can guess that maybe I'll just press this and something will happen. Third mistake happens all the time, mixing up latitude and longitude. Now, not every map system uses latitude and longitude in the same order. Google Maps and Leaflet do latitude, longitude. The GeoJSON specification officially and Map Libra and Mapbox do longitude, latitude. But these, there is no right one. I once thought, man, why did Google Maps do it wrong? Or I thought, like, why did Mapbox reverse these? Well, it turns out there's actually not a, like, completely decided upon standard of this. There's just kind of conventions that have been used in different specifications in different communities over time. So there's not one that's definitely one way or the other. But you need to be able to recognize when you're uh, just screwing up the coordinates. Because lots of times you can think, What's wrong with me? Am I, is my map not working? Is my data all screwed up? Is, is it 
Is it that it's not loading onto the map? That's a really common thing that happens. So use a tool like geojson.io where you load in some geographic data and you immediately see it appear on the other side of the page. Because with this, you can load in something that you know is formatted correctly. You get no errors. And then you look at it and you're like, there's nothing there. Or you look at it and the point is way down in, in Antarctica. That's a very common thing because when you reverse latitude and longitude, especially if you're working, working with like Northern Hemisphere type locations, a lot of times it'll wind up down in Antarctica. And if that happens, it's a clear sign that, you, that your latitude and longitude need to be the other way. So get used to being aware that this is a problem, especially because data comes in a lot of different formats, and be ready to jump between and check that on a regular basis if the data isn't appearing how you expect. Continuing along the data thing, number four, is that people, especially as beginners, a lot of time you get data from some source and you try putting it on the map and the data is way, way, way too detailed for what you actually need. So let's say that you are trying to load like, I don't know, um, like building footprints in your town or lot boundaries or something that's like a polygon or a line. Let's say it's like a road line. A lot of times when you get this data, if you get it from some public source, it's high fidelity. I mean, like one polygon might have like a hundred points just for a little square, even though you don't really need that much. And that's because they're dealing with like people who are doing this as engineers, as specialists, city planners who really want to have super high precision data. But for your web map and for the general public, unless you're doing this from like the standpoint of a very, very important analytical tool, you don't really need that kind of precision of data. So you can use some tools like Turf or other tools out there like Mapshaper.org to simplify your data. Now, the benefit of this is that your data, your, your map is going to load a lot faster. It's going to be a lot less of a hassle to upload this data to something like Mapbox where there's like size limits. So if you have like this 10 megabyte file, but you can't upload it because it only takes five, simplify the data a little bit. You probably will be surprised that you won't lose much of anything from that. Uh, there's lots of times where I've been working with data of like, let's say states or something, and I simplified at 75%. And I couldn't even tell by looking at it unless I zoomed in super far to where users are virtually never zooming in. So if you're dealing with data that's at kind of a state level or visualizing things on that, on, in that way, rivers, bear in mind that people aren't going to notice the tiniest little twist of the river on your line unless they're super zoomed in. So try simplifying your data. It'll make your life easier and it'll make your map load much faster for your users. Finally, number five is not using bounding boxes. Really common thing that we don't do when we're beginners because we don't even know what the heck a bounding box is. So what we usually do as beginners and what all the mapping libraries show you to start is using a, a center point and a zoom level to open your map. So let's say you have some data here in Vancouver and you want people when they open your map to see your data right away. Uh, the most common thing you would do is you'd make the cent you'd find what the center of Vancouver is in latitude and longitude, and then you would kind of like mess around and experiment and find a zoom level so that when you load the map, it loads. And there's Vancouver, and it's zoomed out enough, and it's looking good. Now, this would work fine if everybody had the same screen size as you, if everybody's browser window was the same size as you. But if you're on a big monitor developing, or if you're on a laptop but people are going to be on their phones and they're going to be holding their phones in portrait or they're going to be holding it in landscape. They're all going to open with the map being a bit of a different shape unless you really, really tightly control like your map is exactly 100 pixels wide and 100 pixels tall. But usually our maps are like 100% width and then some height. So that means that the width will stretch and what was zoomed out to a nice level on your desktop is zoomed wrong is zoomed to a too far out or it's too far in on a mobile device. And some of your data might be like po poking off the edges or it might just be in a little clump in the middle of the map. So for this, we use bounding boxes. Now I have another episode about turf bounding boxes and why they're so great and why you want to use them. But a bounding box is basically like this thing you can do where you get the rectangle that, in co that covers all your points. So inside that rectangle, it, it's like all your points would fit inside that. 
and all the mapping libraries have at least a function called fit bounds, where it's a better way to do this whole loading the map. Basically, when you load the map, you're like, okay, I want them to see all this data regardless of the size of the map. And when you call fit bounds, no matter what size the map is, it'll zoom it so that it's at the ideal spot to show all that data that's inside the bounding box. So if that's at all a difficult concept, check out that other video on bounding boxes. It'll help out. And it's not necessarily something that's going to be like a map breaking experience, but it's one of those things that I notice and that can be a little bit of uh, an extra touch that really brings your map to the next level and makes you feel like a specialist when you're working on it. So feel free to ask questions if, as a beginner, there's other weird things you've run into. Love to share more, and we'll see you in the next video. Have a great time.